On the night of December the 28th of 2022, the Howell Township Police Department in New Jersey was called to the scene of a hit-and-run accident on Lanes Mill Road. Responding officers found that a traffic light pole had been struck and was blocking the westbound traffic lane. They also discovered a front bumper piece from the vehicle that had collided with the pole. The police caught up with the driver they suspected to have been involved in the accident at a gas station on Kent Road. During her interview with the officers, 21-year-old Teresa Lee said that she was returning from an Applebee's and admitted that she'd consumed alcohol. As shown in body cam footage, which subsequently went viral, Teresa name-dropped her father, John Lee, who was an officer with the Monmouth County Sheriff's Office. The young woman was repeatedly asked about hitting the pole and vehemently denied it, even though a large piece of her front bumper was missing. Teresa initially said that the missing piece had already been hanging loose after she'd struck a deer in Pennsylvania. Officers radioed for the fragment to be brought to the gas station so that they could see if it matched Teresa's car. It did, and Teresa's lies unraveled. She not only admitted that she was drunk, but also that she'd hit something while texting behind the wheel. As the interaction progressed, Teresa started crying and asked to call her father, whose status as a member of law enforcement she'd already mentioned multiple times. The officer interviewing her pointed out, your dad, the sheriff's officer, wasn't driving your vehicle today. John Lee was ultimately called to the scene. Upon arrival, he inquired about the situation, offering his assistance and pledging not to interfere with his daughter's arrest. A sergeant also asked John not to get involved so that he wouldn't compromise the integrity of the investigation, and he fully cooperated. Teresa performed poorly during field sobriety exercises and was placed under arrest. She repeatedly cried out for her father while she was being handcuffed. As she was led to the back of a police vehicle, the young woman sobbed, I'm the captain of the soccer team. While crying, she again asked for her father before being placed in the back of the vehicle. She hugged him, likely still expecting him to get her out of the arrest, but John sternly told her, Will you stop? Get in the car. You're arrested for DUI. Internet users reacting to the video would praise the man's attitude throughout the arrest and described his reaction as him teaching his daughter a valuable lesson at the station. A breathalyzer test revealed that Teresa's blood alcohol was more than twice the legal limit. She was charged with operating a vehicle while under the influence, reckless driving, failure to report an accident, and leaving the scene of an accident. Number 6. Dylan and Marco Puente On August the 15th of 2020, officers from the Keller Police Department pulled over 22-year-old Dylan Puente for making a wide right turn. Officer Blake Shimanik ordered Dylan to get out of the car and berated him for rolling his window up when he'd first approached him, claiming that it was suspicious behavior. Shimanik then handcuffed the young man. Dylan's father, Marco, had been following behind him in his truck. He stopped his vehicle and started speaking to Dylan while the latter was held against his car by Shimanik. Explaining the reason for being in handcuffs, Dylan told his father that the officer got mad that I rolled up my window. Dylan then said to Marco, I rolled up my window like you said it was my right to roll up my window, a statement which the police officer dismissed as untrue. The seemingly innocuous father-son interaction would lead to a violent incident. Shamanic warned Marco that he was interfering and that he would be arrested for blocking the roadway. Marco parked his truck and returned to silently record Dylan's arrest from a distant sidewalk on the residential street. In the moments that followed, Shamanic told his colleague, Officer Ankit Toma, to arrest Marco for blocking the roadway even though he was no longer in his truck. Toma approached the father and ordered him to put his phone down, but Marco refused and insisted that he was doing nothing wrong. He then asked another resident to record what was happening in the moments that followed. Shimanic came at Marco from behind and tried to wrestle the phone out of his hands. Marco fought back and the officer tried to put him in a headlock, but the father pushed him off. Shimanic and Toma were able to bring Marco down as he cried out, Oh my God! Toma then knelt on Marco's shoulder and then threatened him with pepper spray, which he then deployed at Shimanic's order. The duo handcuffed Marco, who in visible pain exclaimed, My eyes are on fire! Dude, give me a towel! This is crazy! When Lieutenant Craig Berry arrived at the scene, Shimanic told him that Dylan had been acting squirrely during the traffic stop. 
Even though the 22-year-old had been fully compliant, Shamanic reported, I'm quite certain there's narcotics in the car, so I think I'm going to arrest him for the wide right turn. The father and son were taken to jail, but no narcotics were found. The charges against Marco and Dylan's wide right turn fine were subsequently dismissed, with the police chief admitting that his officers had acted inappropriately. The case gained national attention after Marco posted footage of his wrongful arrest and with the release of body cam footage which went viral in the fall of 2020. In December of that year, Marco filed a lawsuit in federal court against the two officers, alleging they'd used excessive force, treated him inhumanely by refusing to wipe the pepper spray from his eyes and racially profiled Dylan for being Hispanic in a failed attempt to find narcotics. In January of 2021, the father and son were awarded $200,000. Through their attorneys, they expressed disappointment that Shamanic and Toma were still employed by the Keller Police Department. The former had been a sergeant at the time of the wrongful arrest, but was demoted in the aftermath, with an internal affairs memo reading, these types of decisions are not acceptable at a supervisory level. Number 5. Tara Baig Following a lane-change traffic dispute that occurred in the summer of 2023, Texas woman Tara Begg followed another driver for over 20 minutes and several miles until he parked his car. The latter, a content creator who went by King James the Savage on TikTok and other social media platforms, took out his cell phone and recorded Begg as she brutally berated him. The woman gave James a middle finger, insulted him, and encouraged him to record the license plate of her Audi A7. Begg threatened, my daddy's the popo, a statement she then repeated while doing a little dance. She continued boasting that there was nothing James could do to her because of her daddy's police connections. Beg also said, keep recording me, I'm pretty, before further demeaning James by telling him to later touch himself to the clip. The interaction ended in Beg saying, I already got your license plate, my daddy's going to come get you. James uploaded the video and it gained millions of views online. Beg who became known as Road Rage Karen, drew widespread condemnation for her behavior, which one user described as beyond obnoxious. Some pointed out that Beg, who was reportedly in her 30s, was far too old to be relying on her father to settle her arguments. However, after it emerged that her father was a pharmacist and not the popo, users wondered whether Beg might have been referring to her sugar daddy. Netizens tracked the woman down via her license plate and reportedly found that the name on the plate was that of a healing crystal store that the woman, a licensed therapist, owned. The store was subsequently struck by a wave of bad reviews. As of the latest updates on the matter, Beg had set all of her social media accounts to private. Number 4. Tiffany on May the 4th of 2022, law enforcement somewhere in the US responded to reports of battery at a CVS. They talked to a young woman only identified as 25-year-old Tiffany, whom they believed had been involved in the incident. She immediately became belligerent, claiming that everybody was yelling at her, even though she hadn't done anything. As shown in body cam footage, the officer who'd approached her had been entirely calm. Tiffany claimed that she'd recently learned her mother had cancer and that a friend of her mother's whom she identified as Kelly was being a B-word about it. As the conversation progressed, officers learned that Tiffany had intentionally poured her soda on Kelly, which resulted in the latter alerting the police. Tiffany's father was present at the scene and corroborated her version of events. As she talked to the police, the young woman held her cell phone to her ear, claiming that she was trying to call Kelly and apologize. However, Tiffany also reported that in the conflict's wake, she was harassed and forcibly touched by a blonde guy. On the street, given the previous incident with her mother's friend, the interviewing officer found that the second story lacked credibility. In the moments that followed, Tiffany became uncooperative, swore at the officers, and started walking away in spite of their commands for her to wait at the scene. The 25-year-old remained with her phone pressed to her ear throughout her interaction with law enforcement, even though she wasn't talking to anyone. Tiffany again tried walking away after telling an officer not to push her, threatening that she would push back. 
In the moments that followed, she was taken down to be placed under arrest and started screaming. When her father tried to intervene, he was brought under control as well. During the struggle, Tiffany was captured on body cam yelling, get off of me, and then kicking a police officer. Once subdued, Tiffany was escorted to the police vehicle. As she kept shouting, Daddy, a cry she repeated once in the back of the vehicle. The officer told her, your daddy can't get you out of this, and she was charged with battery upon a peace officer. Number 3. Avraham Gill On the afternoon of January the 27th of 2024, the teenage son of an Israeli diplomat was recklessly riding his motorcycle through traffic on Sunny Isles Beach in Florida. A police lieutenant screamed at 19-year-old Avraham Gill and motioned for him to stop, but he continued driving and intentionally ran him over. In spite of suffering an incapacitating injury to his leg, the unnamed officer was able to grab Gill off his motorcycle and take him to the ground. According to an arrest report, Avaram had told responding law enforcement that he'd been waving through cars because he hates waiting behind traffic. He was arrested for aggravated battery on a law enforcement officer and resisting an officer with violence, both felonies. Avaram was pictured crying hysterically in his mugshot, which was widely distributed in the media. In the incident's aftermath, the teen's attorney argued that the charges should be dropped because Miami-Dade law didn't apply to him. He was reportedly a beneficiary of diplomatic immunity granted to him through his father, Eli, a consul for administration at the Israeli consulate in Miami. Avaram's attorney was also critical of Sunny Isles Beach Police for failing to recognize the teen as the relative of a consulate member. According to updates from early February of 2024, NBC Miami had obtained a statement from the US State Department that partly read, we can confirm that as the dependent of an Israeli consular officer, the concerned individual is not entitled to civil or criminal immunity. Avaram remained charged and a hearing was set for the morning of February the 26th. The police officer he'd run over was unable to return to his duties because of the leg injury. The viral mugshot wasn't the first instance of the teen crying for his daddy. During a run-in with law enforcement, on December the 31st of 2023, he was stopped in Miami Shores for several traffic offenses and told the police that his father was an Israeli diplomat, which resulted in the authorities calling his parents, hidden by a plate that flipped up. Avaram's motorcycle featured at the time a vanity plate that read, Please Chase. Today's topic was requested by Manager Hall. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comment section below. Number 2. Mark Bladen In March of 2018, Australian man Mark Bladen went to the Gap Skate Park in Brisbane, Australia to confront a male teenager who'd allegedly bullied his stepdaughter, Kalani. It would later emerge that the teen, whose identity wasn't revealed, had been feuding with Kalani on social media. She'd allegedly made comments about his mother on Snapchat, and he retaliated by calling her a gorilla and King Kong. He was also reported to have given Kalani cruel gifts that included shaving cream. Other incidents involved the boy pushing her and spitting on her. On March the 3rd, Mark reportedly found his daughter crying over the bullying and asked for the location of her alleged tormentor, with Kalani replying that he was at the skate park. A clip of the ensuing confrontation went viral. 53-year-old Mark was recorded pointing his finger in the teen's face and berating him as he sat on a bench with several of his friends. In a subsequent 60 Minutes interview on the matter, Mark claimed that he'd initially only intended to give the boy a good old-fashioned talking to. The father reported that he was about to walk away but snapped when the teen tauntingly smiled at him. Moments later, the enraged man was recorded lunging at the boy and grabbing him by the throat with both hands. He forced him onto his back and began choking him. The boy helplessly flailed about until several of his friends intervened and pulled Mark off him. The father was subsequently arrested for assault. He pleaded guilty to the charge in Brisbane's Magistrates Court on March the 20th and was sentenced to pay $1,000 with no conviction recorded. Mark was hailed as a hero by his friends at the local pub and his wife, 
Kalani's mother stood by his actions, stating that he'd reacted in a manner that any parents in his position would have. A number of internet users commented on the viral clip were, however, critical of Mark's violent outburst. During the 60 Minutes interview, the father admitted that it was a stupid thing to do but also stated, We live in a day of PC, political correctness, and I hate it. I absolutely hate it. He added that when he was young, a lady was treated as a lady and that it wasn't hard to respect someone. In a letter released through his lawyer, the teen whom Mark had assaulted reported that he'd been left extremely distressed by the attack itself, as well as the media attention surrounding it. The boy wrote that he cried at night from nightmares of the man strangling him and maintained that his behavior towards Kalani had been a reaction to her bullying him first. We have our release about top 12 worst courtroom crybabies lined up for you straight after number one. Stick around to watch that one too if you'd like. Number 1. Christopher Freeman In March of 2019, Florida man Christopher Freeman received a FaceTime call from his son, who was crying, and told him that a teacher at Bear Lakes Middle School had pushed him when an assistant principal intervened during the call. Freeman reportedly yelled, You're all dead. About an hour later, the wheelchair-bound Freeman showed up at the school. As reported by the Sun Sentinel, he was distraught and yelled out, I want to see the guy who slammed my son. I've got something for him. A staff member noticed the pistol protruding out of the man's pants. Police for the Palm Beach County School District soon arrived at the campus and the school was placed on red code lockdown. Freeman refused to be searched, at which point backup was called to force his compliance. During the search, it was discovered that the enraged father had an AK-47 mini Draco pistol stuffed in his pants. The weapon had a bullet in the chamber and a 30-round magazine. Freeman reportedly claimed that he'd bought the automatic pistol for protection about a year prior and that he'd forgotten he had it on him. The man claimed that he didn't intend to harm anyone and that he wasn't aware firearms weren't allowed on school property. He was arrested for possession of a firearm on school grounds, aggravated assault with a weapon, and disrupting the peace with a bond set at $75,000. While being sentenced for her crimes in March of 2016, 17-year-old Roxana Sikorsky cried as she apologized to her parents, lamenting that she hadn't been the daughter they wanted. Sikorsky, along with her boyfriend at the time, 23-year-old Michael Rivera had allegedly plotted to kill her entire family. At around 2 a.m. on October the 17th of 2014, the team was inside her family's Detroit home, while Rivera sat in his car outside, giving her instructions via text. The man sent her a diagram of the neck and gave instructions on how to cut it like a tomato. He also told her to make sure the victim stopped breathing. Sikorsky sliced her brother's neck before attempting to stab her younger sister. When their parents heard the screams, they immediately intervened before the younger sister could be harmed. The victim was taken to the Mott Children's Hospital in Ann Arbor, where he underwent surgery. Sikorsky fled the scene with Rivera, but they were arrested hours later at the latter's home on Detroit's southwest side. They were both charged with four counts of conspiracy to commit murder and one count of assault. Their bail was set at $1 million each. On July the 23rd of 2015, Rivera was convicted on all charges, including attempted murder and using a computer to commit a crime. The following month, he was sentenced to life in prison. In a separate case in September, he was handed a 30 to 180 month sentence after he was found guilty of having unlawful intercourse with Sikorsky in July of 2014. Sikorsky pleaded guilty to one count of assault with intent to murder in February of 2016. As part of the deal, the other charges against her were dropped. According to the Daily Mail, her mother pleaded with the judge to go easy on her daughter, who'd been receiving treatment for depression and ADHD. Nevertheless, Sikorsky was sentenced to 10 to 20 years behind bars. Number 11. Ashford Thompson Police officer Joshua McTardian was conducting a traffic stop at the intersection of Route 91 and Glenwood in Twinsburg, Ohio, when he was shot in the head four times. The incident unfolded at around 2 a.m. on July the 13th of 2008, when the 33-year-old officer stopped Ashford Thompson for allegedly driving under the influence. 
Upon being placed under arrest, 23-year-old Thompson, who had a permit to carry a concealed weapon, struggled with Mictarian before pulling a gun and opening fire. The officer was pronounced dead at Metro Health Medical Center shortly before 3 a.m. Meanwhile, Thompson was arrested at a Cambridge Drive home where he used to reside. A week later, the young man was indicted on charges of aggravated murder, escape, and tampering with evidence in connection to Mictarian's death. He initially pleaded guilty to aggravated murder but later withdrew his plea. When Thompson appeared in court on January the 27th of 2010, he cried as he described his life behind bars. He told the judge about the harassment he had to deal with, including not receiving his mail and having his bedsheets taken away. While openly weeping, he claimed he couldn't get any kind of justice and said, just execute me, I'm tired of it. Thompson was later found guilty and sentenced to death in June of 2010. Number 10. Shelby Isaac In January of 2016, a Tennessee couple and their unborn child were killed. Over $250 worth of hair weaves, 18-year-old Shelby Isaac met with 34-year-old Eddie Tate II in Memphis to discuss purchasing the hair weaves in question. After the transaction was complete, Isaac set up another meeting with Tate to get a refund, according to investigators. When Tate pulled up to the 2100 block of Westchester Circle on January the 22nd, Isaac reportedly opened fire on his car. Tate and his girlfriend, 35-year-old Edwina Thomas, who was nearly eight weeks pregnant, sustained multiple gunshot wounds. Tate died at the scene while Thomas was rushed to Regional Medical Center in critical condition. She would later suffer the same fate as her boyfriend. Initially, prosecutors tried to charge Isaac with three counts of murder, but the case was dismissed due to a lack of evidence with no probable cause. The following day, prosecutors successfully obtained a grand jury indictment against Isaac. During the ensuing trial, the prosecution showed the jury fingerprint evidence that implicated the suspect in the crime. Witnesses testified that Isaac had blood on her clothes and a lot of cash on her person shortly after the couple were killed. Isaac was found guilty of two counts of second-degree murder in the shooting deaths of Tate and Thomas. She was also convicted of reckless homicide and criminally negligent homicide of the unborn baby. As the judge polled the jurors, Isaac collapsed to the ground where she remained for a few minutes before sobbing, Mummy. She was sentenced to 30 years in Tennessee State Prison. Number 9. Dominique Slaughter After stealing a credit card on August 23rd of 2019, 26-year-old Dominique Whitney Slaughter from Detroit, Michigan was arrested. He later pleaded guilty to possessing a stolen credit card and carrying a concealed weapon. On May the 17th of 2021, Judge Kelly Ramsey sentenced him to 12 months behind bars, followed by 18 months of probation plus restitution payments and fines. Ramsey allowed Slaughter to remain free on probation with a GPS tether in order for him to work and pay off his restitution as well as to resolve six outstanding warrants he had in other jurisdictions. 14 months after being sentenced, Slaughter was back in court for his scheduled surrender and to start serving his custodial sentence. His probation officer informed Ramsey that Slaughter violated home zone violations, hadn't paid any of his fees and restitution, hadn't resolved his pending warrants, and had an additional four warrants to his name. There were also several instances during which his GPS tether had been shut down. As Ramsey mentioned Slaughter's consequent prison time, the latter reportedly became distraught, raising his hands while holding his head. The judge demanded that he stand straight and face her. Slaughter then started to put his hands in front of his face as he wept and begged Ramsey to give him at least a few hours to get things in order for his family. The man continued to weep and beg but the judge remained adamant that he needed to surrender that day. Ramsey told him, come on now, breaking the law has its consequences. Number 8. Jaleel Markeith Smith Riley On the night of November the 16th of 2013, police responded to the 5200 block of Carthage Avenue in Norwood, Ohio, after receiving reports that a Cincinnati couple had been shot in their car. At approximately 10.30 p.m., responding officers found 21-year-old Aaron Martin standing outside of the car with a gunshot wound to the head, speaking incoherently. They also found 20-year-old Proshia Brooks unresponsive with several gunshot wounds of her own 
She was taken to the University of Cincinnati Medical Center where she succumbed to her wounds three days later. Martin survived but reportedly suffered permanent brain damage. Surveillance footage revealed that three men approached the couple's vehicle moments before the shooting unfolded. Investigators believed that it was an armed robbery that turned violent. Nearly two years later, three suspects were identified. The shooter, 22-year-old Jaleel Markeith Smith Riley, was arrested in Cincinnati. The other two male suspects had no ties to the area. One was already jailed in another state, while the other was deceased. On August 11th of 2016, Smith Riley avoided the death penalty by pleading guilty to aggravated murder and attempted murder. Two months later, during his sentencing at Hamilton County Common Pleas Court, he started shedding tears. As he was about to address the court, he apologized and said that he still hoped to go home someday. After the judge sentenced him to life in prison without the possibility of parole, Smith Riley sat on the floor of the courtroom and continued to cry. Number 7. Dylan Shoemaker After being convicted of the murder of his girlfriend's young son, New York teen Dylan Shoemaker wept and claimed he didn't mean to kill the boy. Shortly before 4.20 p.m. on March the 19th of 2013, the 16-year-old was babysitting his girlfriend's two children at a Springville Village home in Concord. The mother, 19-year-old Ashley Smith, was working a shift at a nearby pizza hut. When Smith arrived home at the end of the night, one of her sons was dead and Shoemaker was consequently arrested. Investigators determined that the teen had beaten the boy to the point of death. A forensic pathologist from the Erie County Medical Examiner's Office determined that the victim suffered blunt force and impact injuries to his head neck, torso, and extremities. The injuries were consistent with having been repeatedly struck and pushed or slammed to the ground. Following the teen's conviction in January of the following year, State Supreme Court Justice M. William Bowler called him a manipulator and deceiver for his attempt to sway the jury with tears. Shoemaker had previously told his mother during a phone call that all he had to do was cry in front of the jury and that they'd feel sorry for him. Bowler ultimately sentenced him to 25 years to life in prison. Number 6. Antonio Barbo Wisconsin teen Antonio Barbo was sentenced to life in prison after prosecutors successfully argued that he murdered his great-grandmother in her Sheboygan Falls home on September the 17th of 2012. Barbo, along with another teenager, Nathan Pape, broke into 78-year-old Barbara Olson's home to rob her. He reportedly attacked Olson with a hatchet, while Pape attacked her with a hammer. She was killed, and Barbo initially tried to put her body in the trunk of a car. When he was unable to, however, he put it in the garage and covered it up with a blanket before fleeing in his great-grandmother's vehicle. Two days later, the body was found and the boys responsible were charged with intentional homicide, to which they pleaded not guilty. Barbo did so by reason of a mental disease or defect. According to Barbo's family, he'd never been the same after suffering a brain injury in a serious car accident. During the resulting trial, Barbo said that he and his co-defendant each struck the victim three to four times during the attack. But according to a medical examiner, Olsen suffered more than 18 blows to the head. Barbo eventually pleaded no contest and apologized for what he'd done, saying he regretted his actions. He broke down in tears during his sentencing on August the 12th of 2013. The following day, his accomplice, who had also been found guilty, was sentenced to life in prison. Pape and Barbo will be eligible for parole when they turn 45 and 50, respectively. Number 5. Arnesia C. Washington Texas woman Arnesia C. Washington was charged with murder after she struck a man with her car on a Houston freeway. On May the 7th of 2016, according to a witness, 30-year-old Washington had been driving erratically, weaving back and forth across lanes before swerving into a concrete barrier. Subsequently, she accelerated into the back of a motorcycle, being ridden by Steve Rudolph. Washington allegedly continued driving after striking Rudolph and only stopped when other motorists intervened. In the aftermath, several vehicles piled up along the West Loop northbound at Evergreen Street. A nurse who witnessed the crash gave Rudolph CPR, but the 59-year-old ultimately succumbed to his injuries. Court documents indicated that Washington later admitted to driving while intoxicated. 
Prosecutors told the court that the accused was high on hydrocodone, with two toddlers in the car during the incident. KPRC-TV reported that the woman broke down in tears during court proceedings. She was ultimately convicted of felony murder and sentenced to 50 years behind bars. Number 4. Darla Renee Jackson A California woman was charged with the first-degree murder of 39-year-old Navy Chief Petty Officer Zach Buob, who died on State Route 54 in San Diego on May the 28th of 2015. 25-year-old Darla Renee Jackson was driving a Nissan Altima on Interstate 5 at around 5.30 p.m. when she cut Buob off. In retaliation, the latter allegedly rode his motorcycle aggressively and made hand gestures at the motorist before kicking the side of her car. The defense attorney would later claim that Buob's kick left a dent and a shoe print on the vehicle. Video footage of the incident revealed that Jackson subsequently chased Buob down at high speed. The man slowed down and the nose of Jackson's car rolled up onto the back wheel of the motorcycle. The two vehicles skidded together for about 315 feet before they became dislodged, at which point Buob hit the ground and got run over by Jackson. He later succumbed to his injuries at a hospital. Five days later, Jackson was arrested and held on a $1 million bond. She initially pleaded not guilty in a court appearance during which she trembled and sobbed. In January of 2017, she pleaded guilty to voluntary manslaughter and was given a six-year prison sentence. In an interview at Vista County Jail, Jackson told ABC News that she deeply regretted what had happened because it turned out terribly for everyone involved. Number 3. Courtney Clenny OnlyFans model Courtney Clenny was accused of fatally stabbing her boyfriend in their luxury Miami condo on April the 3rd of 2022. Law enforcement found the 26-year-old holding her bleeding boyfriend, 28-year-old Christian Obomselli, in her arms at their condo unit on Northeast 7th Avenue in Edgewater. Obomselli later died and Clenny was arrested on a charge of second-degree murder. The woman cried and wiped her eyes with tissues as she was denied bond. Her defense lawyers claimed that many witnesses would testify that Clenny was a victim of domestic violence and that she'd acted to save her own life. However, prosecutors argue that Obamselli was the clear victim. The woman was held in Miami Dade jail while awaiting trial. Number 2. Jennifer Ann Mee After being found guilty of first-degree murder on September the 20th of 2013, 22-year-old Jennifer Ann Mee was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Before her criminal exploits came to light, Mee became nationally known after making multiple television appearances for her uncontrollable hiccuping, leading to her being dubbed Hiccup Girl. In 2010, she lured a Walmart worker, 22-year-old Shannon Griffin, to an abandoned home under the pretense of buying marijuana. When Griffin arrived, two of Mee's accomplices robbed him at gunpoint. Griffin struggled, was shot four times, and died in the aftermath. Mee's attorney contended that she hadn't been the one to orchestrate the robbery and there wasn't enough evidence to convict her. Prosecutors, meanwhile, argued that Mee set the deadly crime into motion using evidence such as police interviews and a taped jailhouse phone call between Mee and her mother. After deliberating for four hours, a Pinellas County jury found her guilty. Me wept as the verdict was read aloud. Her co-defendants, Laron Rayford and Lamont Newton, were also likewise convicted and sentenced to life in prison. Number 1. Brittany Zamora In March of 2018, a sixth grade teacher at Las Brisas Academy in Goodyear, Arizona, was arrested for having intimate relations with one of her students. Police reports indicated that in the late fall of 2017, 27-year-old Brittany Zamora told her students to text her if they ever got bored. One of her students began messaging her and their conversations reportedly transformed into flirting. Between February and March of 2018, Zamora had intercourse with the victim several times, both in her car and classroom. The pair's Instagram direct messages were explicit in nature. In a screenshot of their DMs, Zamora said that she'd quit her job and have intercourse with the victim all day if she could. The teen's parents found out about the conversation by way of a parental app. 
They confronted their son, who subsequently admitted to his relationship with Zamora. His parents called the school principal, and the teacher was swiftly arrested. In July of 2019, Zamora pleaded guilty to charges that included misconduct with a minor and public indecency. She wiped away a tear as her attorney patted her shoulder while she was sentenced to 20 years behind bars. Thanks for watching. Would you rather live with your parents into your mid-40s or be homeless for a year? Let us know in the comments section below.